Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2022 Student Success Summit uh, Shutdown Restart. Uh, this is our second day of the summit. Um, and we are delighted to welcome you all here today uh, for our session focused on policy and politics um, with a terrific panel of presenters uh, that will focus on the upcoming elections, um, some policy issues in community colleges and or policy issues and the implications for those on community colleges. Uh, my name is Erica Oriens. I'm the executive director of the Michigan Center for Student Success. Um, I'm joined today uh, by my colleagues, Jenny Shanker, Precious Miller, and Donna Petrus, who um, have done uh, great work to plan this event for you today. Um, we start planning the summit about a year in advance um, and uh, remembering where we were a year ago uh, really kind of inspired our, our theme for the summit. Um, thinking about it feels like a really good time to do what our IT folks tell us, shut down, restart, and, and think about the great student success that will be work that we'll be doing moving forward. Uh, our agenda today includes a panel discussion. Um, I'll introduce the panel in a couple of minutes. Uh, we will have plenty of time uh, at the end of the session for audience questions. And so you can add those questions into the chat. Um, you can send those to everyone or you can send those to me privately as well. Um, and then we reserve about the last 20 minutes of our session for uh, what we refer to as speed networking and really that idea of um, trying to find an opportunity virtually to uh, support you in meeting colleagues from across the state. The, uh, I wanted to point out a couple of just administrative things to talk about. Um, number one, if you go out to the MCCA website where you registered today, um, and thanks for Precious for including the link in the chat, um, you'll be able to find a, a booklet or a journal that Precious put together to facilitate you taking notes um, and share with you some of the resources from our summit. Uh, you'll also notice that we have placeholders there um, for the slides, recordings, and any session materials that are shared today. Um, we will be uh, sharing those uh, at the end of the summit, um, probably uh, um, sending those out to all of you next week. Um, and so if you're looking for the slides um, or if you're or looking for the recording that you wanted to share with a colleague, you'll be able to find that in the same place on the MCCA website. All right, uh, with that, I'd like to um, transition to uh, introducing our uh, panelists and facilitator today. Uh, the first person I'd like to introduce is Brandy Johnson. Uh, Brandy is the, I don't think we can say new anymore, um, but she is the president of the Michigan Community College Association, uh, where she leads the association's public policy advocacy efforts to benefit community colleges uh, and the students we serve. Uh, prior to her role at MCCA, Brandy was a policy advisor for Governor Gretchen Whitmer and the founding executive director for the Michigan College Access Network. Jose Miranda is the Director of Government Relations at the Association of Community College Trustees, where he leads federal policy advocacy work to support community colleges. Prior to his role at ACCT, Jose worked in the US House of Representatives and the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. Stacey Young is the president of Montcalm Community College and serves on the MCCA Legislative Committee, where she contributes to the MCCA policy and advocacy strategy. Prior to her presidency at Montcalm, Stacey led the business division at Southwestern Community College, another member of MCCA. Last but not least, Monica Martinez is a lobbyist with the Michigan Legislative Consultants, which is MCCA's multi-client lobbying firm, where she supports MCCA's legislative policy strategy. Monica was a founding board member of Advancing Women in Energy, 
a co-founder and former board member of Hispanics and Energy and the past chairperson of the DEI Committee for Michigan Energy Workforce Development Consortium. Monica is going to be serving as our facilitator of the panel today, although um, she is uh, uh, an excellent uh, lobbyist in her own right, so I'm sure she'll be able to share a lot of her thoughts with us as well. Uh, with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen um, and I'm going to turn it over to Monica to facilitate our panel. Monica? Thank you so much, Erica. I am so excited to be here and I hope all of you who are on can kind of feel some of the energies that we can try to transmit through the internet over to you. So we're going to do our best. Um, and really, thank you so much, Brandy, Jose and Stacy for taking a part of this. You know, so much of what we're doing is trying to make sure that every one of you, you know, is aware of all of the important things that are impacting and affecting community colleges statewide and having your being a part of this is so crucial to the success of what we do here in Lansing and in DC. So thank you so much for that. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and kick start it off with Randy. So as you know, the first question, so you should all know that we're going to line up some questions. I'll have some questions for everybody, but know that you can go ahead and submit your questions in. You can put them in the chat or anywhere else, and we'll kind of keep an eye out for it. Um, but afterwards, we'll also follow up with some questions. So kind of get your brains turning on all of that stuff to make sure that it's there. So Brandy, since I already prepped you and said that you were going to be my first one that I was going to be getting the question off to, hope you're all ready and in gear. So really, the state of Michigan has made significant and historic investments in community colleges through state appropriations. Um, we think about reconnect, other important investments, you know, as, at funding levels that we haven't seen before. Can you tell us a little bit more about this funding and what we've seen lately? Yeah, and, and thank you so much, Erica, and the student success team for including me in your summit, and um, it's just a real pleasure to be with you all uh, today. So um, this was a really exciting budget year for community colleges. Uh, well, first, we got a budget before the 11th hour on September 30th <laughs> at midnight, which I know the CFOs um, and the presidents and trustees are really thrilled about this was the first year in Whitmer's uh, uh, term that we actually got a budget done right around the beginning of July, which was uh, very exciting. And I wanted to make a special note that the governor made the decision to sign her education budget on the campus of Mott Community College, which I think is really emblematic of the important place that community colleges uh, have uh, within the, the state and the administration and what a focal point within the budget uh, it was. So the fact that she signed it at a community college and not at a, in a K-12 setting was actually really meaningful and, and symbolic. Uh, in terms of operational funding, uh, uh, we saw about a 5% increase to community college operations. This was a net increase of about $13 million more this year than the previous year, um, but distributed through our existing funding formula. Um, however, the budget also called for us to reconvene and reevaluate our current funding formula. So a task force is starting uh, right now um, that includes four, uh, four legislators, uh, a representative of the governor, myself, and three of our presidents. Um, to discuss making modifications to our funding formula moving forward. Um, so we got a, a decent, healthy increase in operations, but I would say some of these, some of the other special projects in the budget was really um, what got a lot of attention. Um, first and foremost, I wanted to mention the $56 million of funding that was included to support an ADN to BSN completion grant program to train more nurses uh, uh, with bachelor's degrees right on our community college campuses. This has been a very long and ongoing policy debate in Michigan, whether or not community colleges ought be able to or be authorized to confer baccalaureate degrees. 
we were able to not only reach a compromise with universities uh, on this very divisive issue, but actually got the state to invest resources to really incent these new partnerships. Um, so we could have a whole nother session on the ADN uh, BSN program, but I'm really proud of our ability to come around um, in terms of a compromise with the universities, but also to get the state to invest um, real resources uh, to solve our nursing shortage. The budget also included $10 million uh, to support uh, academic catch up for students that have recently graduated high school that may have had learning interrupted. Uh, uh, due to uh, the pandemic, this program was inspired by our very own Grand Rapids Community College and their summer bridge program to help students um, uh, transition between high school and, and uh, post-secondary uh, and go straight into credit-bearing coursework without the need for um, uh, standalone developmental remedial education, which is great. Uh, the budget also uh, included $5 million to um, the association um, on behalf of our colleges to support paying for tuition costs for corrections officers. Um, just like a nursing shortage or a teacher shortage we hear about, we also have a real shortage of individuals serving as corrections officers um, in Michigan uh, state prisons. Uh, and they require post-secondary um, credits to have that job. And so this money will support um, basically scholarships for, for those students. Uh, as Monica mentioned, the budget fully funded Michigan Reconnect, which is our, our state's um, premier community college uh, tuition program supporting working age adults age 25 and older, uh, which is exciting. But in addition to the $55 million um, dollars for Reconnect, there were also some major additions to student financial aid, which I think will be um, huge headlines and hopefully relatively soon. One is um, $6 million to support short-term training grants. I know, I imagine Jose will say something about the need for short-term Pell. We are trying to um, beat the feds to the punch by investing in our own version of short-term uh, uh, Pell. And so we got um, our first shot at that. But I would say the big, big news coming out of financial aid in this budget was that the state set aside $250 million for student financial aid for traditional aid students, which is about double the amount of all of our other financial aid programs combined in Michigan. These pro this scholarship program is still being designed and negotiated with the legislature in terms of who will qualify and for what amounts, but this will take us um, a huge step forward in making community college um, functionally tuition free, not just for adults, but um, for for uh, traditional age students, uh, students as well. So um, this was our, our first shot of the budget, but the, the good news is that there is still significant and I mean like very significant dollars uh, still available for the state to spend this year. Um, uh, billions of dollars still on our balance sheet. Uh, on behalf of the association, we are really working with the legislature to encourage them to use these, what are one-time dollars for the most part, for one-time purposes and invest in capital infrastructure uh, at community colleges, both through um, a significant number, 18 different capital outlay projects on our campuses, as well as uh, some significant funds to invest in things like technology, equipment, building maintenance, as well as student housing, which has been um, a priority that we've heard loud and clear from our colleges. And so um, as we go into uh, the rest of the legislative uh, session, just about three more months um, with a big election in between, um, we will be uh, really focusing our efforts around um, uh, these capital uh, outlay investments in our budget. Ooh, that's a whole lot. Did you all get that? Um, you know, there was a lot there. And Brandy, as, as you talk about, there was a lot of successes this past year and a lot of new initiatives, a lot of one-time funding. Some of that is still being looked upon because there is a certain, you know, significant amount of surplus, whether it's federal dollars or state dollars um, that we have, that the state has, that they might be able to expend yet this year and maybe into early next year. And do you think that this high level of investment can continue? 
and kind of what do we expect, you know, just kind of because they said a lot of good stuff and I just want to make sure that we have a pulse on that. Yeah. Um, so, so no, <laughs> I, I don't expect this is a, this is really a once in a lifetime or once in a generation um, level of resources that we have available now. And a, a large part of it is due to one sort of federal stimulus. We've had many, many rounds of significant federal dollars come our way um, that need to be spent. Um, but then also sort of a, a better than anticipated economy. Um, and even during the pandemic, um, you know, uh, people still bought a lot of stuff. I know I had um, daily Amazon deliveries um, to my house and, and um, those goods are taxed. And so I think um, while we were worried about an economic downturn during the pandemic, what we, what we saw is that Michiganders um, still spent a lot of money on goods, um, uh, which helped our state coffers have better than anticipated there's a lot of signs pointing to the fact that we might be heading into an economic downturn, if not a recession. And so, um, you know, at that point, we'll, our, our, our mode will change a little bit uh, to ensure that we're still protecting our current investments in, in community colleges and in student financial, student financial aid. But I would emphasize that this is, this is once in a generation type of revenue that we're seeing. Jose, um, you know, there's a lot happening in DC. We've all heard there's, you know, groundbreaking dollars. There's a lot of key issues that they're talking about. You know, what are some of the major issues that ACCT is tracking? Thank you, Monica. And thank you, Erica and the whole team for inviting me. And also Brandy for laying out the foundation for me because you're going to hear a lot of common themes between what she's hearing, um, what she's sharing at the state level and what I'm gonna hear at the federal level. Though I will note, it is a very, very pleasant message to hear of states actually investing in our post-secondary education and in our institutions, because that is not always the case, even when there is an influx of cash. Um, but to no surprise, the item number one that we're tracking right now is in fact appropriations. Um, as Brandy mentioned, there's a lot of federal dollars out there right now, but a lot of these were one-time investments. Um, and there is one way that we can maintain that sustain, not to the same degree, but a sustained federal investment in higher education, and that's through the annual appropriations process. We are nine days away from the fiscal year ending at the federal level as well. And Brandy, someday I hope to say that we finish our appropriations process at the federal level in July, someday before, my, before I, I die. But because that has not happened in a very, very long time. In fact, we don't even have a top line budget number for discretionary spending this year yet. Uh, Democrats and Republicans, uh, Senate and House appropriators have not agreed on a final number. Without that, we don't know what uh, we're looking at in terms of investments for higher education. We're coming off a year where we saw significant COVID related spent like investments billions of dollars but we also we're also coming off a year the first year in a decade where congress was not tied to a budgetary budgetary cap and so we saw the largest single increase in department of education funding in a decade if not longer at about 15 percent increase we're hoping to see something similar this year but that's not a guarantee and so right now we're keeping tabs on one, Congress ensuring that we don't have a government shutdown in nine days. I don't think that's very likely, but Congress loves drama. And so they will probably leave it down to the wire to come to an agreement on the length of the continuing resolution that's going to keep our government fund open and funded past September 30th, as well as other political provisions that are not necessarily appropriations related that are currently holding up. Uh, the continuing resolution. So that's one, item number one that we're keeping an eye on. To what Brandy said, item number two, and it's somewhat related to, is short-term Pell, or what has been more recently referred to as here in DC as workforce Pell. Um, this has been a top priority for ACCT for many, many years. And this year has been the closest we came to getting it through the finish line. We came up just short. Um, but we had language included in one of the versions for the Bipartisan Innovation Act that was being uh, conferenced and negotiated throughout the summer. Unfortunately, we ran out of time 
Congress ran out of time and they ended up passing a very, very slim down version, of what became the Chips and Science Act, um, which still provided significant investments, especially around manufacturing and like chip manufacturing, but not it did not include the provisions we were looking to, to secure. And so we're looking at an end of year spending bill to see if we can move short term Pell. Uh, it's of great importance to us because three out of the four champions for the bill in Congress are not returning next year. Um, Senator Portman from Ohio is retiring and he sees this this uh, bill as one of his legacy items. So we're hoping that that helps us on the Republican side and then on the Democrat and Republican side, uh, both um, Representative Gonzalez from Ohio and Levin from Michigan are not returning to Congress next year. So it's really important for us to build the momentum we have right now. Unfortunately, we don't know if we're going to see a end of year spending bill. If we don't, it's gonna be a, an even harder battle next Congress, but it's something that we're not going to stop advocating for because we all understand the need for this investment, not just so that we can ensure that we have the workforce that's skilled, ready and strained, but that we're also lowering those economic barriers for non-traditional students or for adults or for anyone who just wants to get additional skills and have a better paying job. Other than that, the other major items we're gonna keep an eye out on are student support service programs and grants that are currently open for competitions, but also we're trying to see what investments we're going to see in a potential fiscal year 2023 appropriation bills. There's a, a couple of new programs that were funded over the past two years. Um, particularly around basic needs, uh, as well as uh, completion, post-secondary completion. Add that to the existing programs like C Campus, uh, Trio, and Gear Up that we're going to keep an eye out on. So this is what we're keeping tabs on uh, for their next three, four months, and then into the next Congress. Thanks so much, Jose. I really appreciated that. Can you talk a little bit about the champions and the coalition on Pell, just to kind of give us some perspective of what that all is like and how that matters to making a difference? Yeah, absolutely. And so having champions both on and off the hill is very important, especially about short-term Pell. We can see this. We have success stories of this. And the best example I can share with you all is Second Chance Pell, which became law in December of 2020, after many, many years of advoc advocacy for that from us, as well as from a whole coalition of groups, we've mounted a very similar campaign around short-term Pell. Um, we have what, what here in DC internally, we call like the Jobs Act Endorsers Coalition. So if you look at the Jobs Act, you look at the list of organizations that have endorsed the proposal, it's not just us, it's not just the Association of Community Colleges, but it's also, uh, National organizations focused on workforce, national organization work um, focused on reskilling, but it's also employers. And we're talking about employers like Intel or uh, manufacturing uh, industries. We're talking about also local community-based partnerships between a community college and their, their local industry, seeing the need, finding the need, and knowing that there's additional resources are needed. So what we're trying to do around this coalition and why we came so close to passing it this year was because we mounted a multiple angles approach. Uh, obviously, going to, to Democrats and, and talking about the equity issue, the access issue, but also going to Republicans and talking about the, the workforce needs, the skills needs, the I actually was just in a, converse, uh, in a conference last week uh, where one of the sessions were, was around workforce. And one of the things that the employers in the panel shared, and these were folks like LinkedIn and General Motor, Motors and Delta were saying like, they're trying to go move away from a bachelor's degree requirement and focus more on the skills space requirement. But you can't do that without having some sort of proof. And this is where community colleges come in. So employers understand that community colleges come play a critical role in this. And so looking at all of this and shaping the message to say, this is not just for the industry, it's not just for the not just good for the workforce, but it's also good for society and for ensuring that we have uh, a population that has life-sustaining wages, family-sustaining wages with benefits, oftentimes, uh, is what got us so close. And then 
So that's on the outside and the, and the inside, which is one of the reasons why I mentioned we're losing three champions, is that we would not have gotten so close if Senator Kane had not pushed with Senator Portman to devise a compromise language last year when this first came uh, as a proposal in a vehicle that both Senate and uh, both Republican and Democrat Senate chairs and the help and ranking member in the help committee agreed upon. And then they were not able to include that in their Senate bill, uh, USICA, because of a technicality. So then you had folks like Levin and Gonzalez in the House push for an inclusion, actually offered the amendment language on the floor when they were passing the American Peace Act and get bipartisan support in the amendment so that it was included in the bill and then it went to cut to the conference. So when I talk about having those champions without someone like Senator Portman, without someone like Representative Levin and Gonzalez there who have been working this for many, many years, it will be a little bit harder next year to do that. It'll be almost like starting over, not quite because everyone knows short-term Pell, everybody understands the need. It's just uh, the devil's in the details sort of issue. What exactly do we wanna include? in terms of legislative language to make it work. Um, but it does set us back because then we have people who wanna change things, who maybe have already been agreed on. Sometimes that's a good thing, but other times that means we're, we might lose off some supporters that we have right now. But this could not be possible if it was just community colleges asking for this, right? You need to have the voice of industry and employers and also community college students themselves who would benefit from these programs, speaking, going to their legislators and sharing why this is important and how this could make a difference in them and their lives. Thank you for that insight. That's a lot to think about. And, you know, as we think about the workforce and people and really making a difference in people's lives, I think that's what community colleges do. Stacy. that's what you do. So when you think about this, Stacy, and, you know, both Jose and Brandy talked about significant investments, what do these investments and policies mean for community colleges? What do they mean for Montcalm Community College? Can you talk a little bit about those in specifics and bring it down home? Sure. So first of all, thank you so much for having me today and um, to Erica for asking. Um, I think you know, what I see from the state and also at the federal level is um, the, the federal and state government saying we respect what you do, we see what you're doing, and we recognize that you can pivot quickly and really connect with the students out there that, that need us the most. Um, I believe and I think they are seeing this, that the investments in the community college and into our communities really invest in our entire region. So we can impact our regions really quickly with these dollars because as we know, um, community colleges are really great at pivoting um, when we need to do something new and change things. Um, you know, I like to say that a lot of things were bubbling up before COVID, but COVID just everything went fast forward and, and it hit us pretty quickly, but I think that was not necessarily a bad thing for us because you know how in higher ed we tend to move what we would like to think about things a little bit, but it did make us rethink about things so you know dollars. Um, like Michigan reconnect. First of all, of course, it lifts up those students who maybe didn't think about college before and gives them these great opportunities, but I think it also helps our employers. When I meet with employers, I like to share with them that if you were thinking about sending um, some of your employees back to work, there's really no better time. Your tuition dollars will go farther because maybe um, they qualify for Michigan Reconnect and then they can participate at the college and maybe you help them with their tuition uh, or their books and things like that that they didn't have the money for before. Um, the other thing is some of these capital improvements that we hope are coming our way um, here, especially with housing for us at Montcalm. Um, you know, a lot of our buildings are almost 60 years old. And, and I share that with many of my friends around the state because we were all developed um, and created in, in the 60s. So many of us have these issues, these infrastructure issues, and, and a lot of our buildings are aging at, at, at about the same time. So investments in our buildings help us because it is kind of over overwhelming to think about the investments that we need to do, um, you know, whether it be with technology or, or frankly, just newer buildings. Um, but we're being smart about it because, um, you know, 
fewer students are coming to campus. Maybe a lot of them are liking the online environment, but it's allowing us to really think about that and make smarter decisions. Um, and I, I really, I think um, for me, when I think about the investments that are coming our way, um, I think there's just no better time for community colleges. We have a generation of students, Generation Z, who don't want to go into debt, who have seen the millennials um, taking jobs that maybe weren't um, the right, you know, what they graduated with. So there's really no better time. We offer such a variety, whether you do want to stay in school and transfer maybe down the road, we have those great articulation agreements and students can start here at a low cost and go on. But also for those students who say, um, I'm, I'm questioning the value of higher ed, but the jobs that my parents had and are at those no longer exist as they were back then. So a job that my dad might have had coming right out of high school, you can't get without a little bit of education. So that's where those short-term training dollars help us because some of those students can grab those short-term training dollars and um, it, it will help them um, uh, get that short-term credential and go off to work. And you know, when I'm talking to employers, that's, that's what I say, help them get a little bit, and then we can um, reinvest later in them, maybe when they want to move into management or continue to grow their career, or maybe that's where they stop and they have a great career with that. Um, so I think there's just no better time for community colleges. Um, I'm so grateful that the state and um, federal government are investing in us in, in these ways. And I have to thank um, Brandy. I think a lot of her work that she has done and the rest of the MCCA staff, I think, you know, with what we're showing with our data with student, the Student Success Center and Brandy's work really pounding the pavement for all of us has really helped us um, in the last year. And I'm just really grateful for them because I see the hard work and, and see, see the results of that. So yeah, that's how it's helping MCC. And I think a lot of my friends around the state as other presidents and our hardworking faculty and staffs. Stacy, thanks for that. I know you've talked before about these investments and especially things like if we can get the Powell Grant happening being game changers. And can you just talk a little bit about that game changer to the student impact and how that makes a difference? Well, so, you know, some of our students don't, they, they're not sure they can do a two-year degree. And so they come in and, um, you know, we need to be able to offer financial aid for those short-term programs and um, they don't have the money to do it otherwise. So having those students, um, get to come to school with some of those extra dollars attached to them and then get out into the workforce. Not only does it help our community in a very fast way, but it helps those students because they oftentimes can see that they are successful in college and, and maybe come back to get that re the rest of the associate's degree and maybe later on even a bachelor's degree. And, and we see that, I, I always talk about weight loss, it's kind of like that. If you step on the scale every morning and you're not going anywhere, it's really hard to keep plugging away. But I think those short-term um, credentials offer them the ability to have some success and then build upon it. Excellent. That's great. Thank you. And we've covered everything on policy, so we're not going to quiz you. Do not worry about that. But, you know, as I've heard and as we've seen, and we all know, in case you haven't seen a political ad yet this season, um, on November 8th, we do have a little thing called an election going on. So, you know, with that election, you know, there's a lot of things um, that are important. So, you know, Jose, can you talk about it from that federal level? I mean, what do we think or what do we anticipate might happen in the House and the Senate? And I know you talked about the champions already, but just in terms of that composition and how might that impact some of our community college priorities? Yeah, um, I would say expect the unexpected, given how apparently nobody, none of the pollsters have any idea what's happening in a month and a half. Um, there's going to be a lot of change. Uh, one way or another, there's a lot of it at stake. Brandy talked a lot, a lot about all the funding that's currently available at the state level, whether it's from the state or from the federal. She talked a lot about one, those being one-time investments, and that is the case. If you look at the level of funding that was just passed in legislation this year or this Congress rather, you know, you go back to March of 2021 and within like the early days of the Biden presidency and they passed the American Rescue Plan, which was 
billions of dollars just for higher education, not to mention everything else. Then you fast forward to this year, uh, just a month ago, and they passed what, uh, they, what, what came to be known as the Inflation Reduction Act, which was the ultra slim down version of the Build Back Better proposal that he had once produced. Again, that's billions of dollars. Not a lot of it, not much of it went to education, but we're still talking a lot about a lot of money going to states. And then you also had some very rare in these days moments of bipartisanship, right? We had a major Chips and Science Act. We had a major bipartisan infrastructure act. These were billions of dollars that were also invested into our economy. You can expect to see none of that next year. Um, and let's start with why. Uh, there is a very, look, very good likelihood that at least one of the two chambers in Congress is going to flip. Most likely the House, potentially the Senate, potentially both. Either way, based on how we're seeing things, we're not going to see a super majority in any one chamber or the other. If it does change leadership or change majority, it will be by slim numbers. Um, but not just the change is not the only thing that's impactful. It's also the new faces. As I mentioned already, you know, and as an example, uh, Representative Levin from Michigan, Representative Gonzalez from Ohio, they're not returning to Congress next year. That's because they both lost their primaries. A lot of folks have been primaried on both parties this year, and many of them lost. Uh, but even more significantly, there's been a lot of people who have been institutional in Congress for many, many years who are retiring. Uh, we have a lot of top appropriators who are retiring at the end of this Congress. And with a lot of new faces also comes a lot of a big learning curve. It also might come with a lot of polarization depending on who won the respective primaries or how the responses are from, from the electorate. So <clears throat> it's, it's going to be a lot of new faces. I don't think the levels of investments in post-secondary education that we've seen this Congress are going to be seen again. In fact, you can probably, depending on who, who is in the majority, you can expect to see a lot of hearings and accountability measures around transparency and wa the idea of wasteful, wasteful spending and holding the administration accountable to where these dollars are going and how it, they're being spent and when they are getting to the states, how that is getting, how, that, it, that is happening. So there's going to be a lot of changes, even if for some reason, miraculous reason, there is no change in the current majority structure. You sh we, we're still not expecting a lot of major investments like we've seen this year and, the, and last year because the appetite for that is just not there anymore. And I think both parties at this point have reached a, uh, a, a point of, hey, we've given you a lot of money to institutions, to states. Where is this money going? How it's being spent? Uh, we need to see like the impact. Luckily for us on the, on the post-secondary side, on the higher education side, most of that money has already been spent or allocated. Um, but you've probably seen the news and heard a lot about complaints on the K-12 side, that money not being spent, that being money supposedly being needed, just sitting there. There's many reasons why that could be, but in Congress, people are getting impatient. So you can expect to see a lot of questions around how this money is being utilized. So I'm glad to see Michigan is doing it really well, <laughs> investing it in our institutions. Thanks for that insight, Jose. So now Brandy, I mean, you know, this week in Lansing, I call it fundraiser palooza. Um, they have so many fundraisers going on for candidates all across the state. It's mind blowing. Um, but, you know, we've had, in case you haven't heard, there is redistricting that happened in Michigan. So we're looking at a lot of new lines. People are facing different districts. Some people, you know, of course, with term limits are not able to run again. Um, you know, can you talk a bit, a little bit of Brandy about Michigan's elections, you know, from governor to state house to the Senate and kind of give us some inclinations of what we might be able to expect? Yeah, it is. Um, I've never seen anything like this year, just the sheer wildness of all of these things happening um, at once. 
we're in a big gubernatorial election year and a, a Senate election year, which means every single member of the House and every single member of the Senate is up for re-election along with the governor. And for the legislature, they're all running in brand new districts. And some of their districts shifted really significantly, meaning the constituents that they had gotten to know um, uh, in, you know, in their previous service, they're having to go out and introduce themselves to, you know, new congregations at churches and new, um, you know, civic organizations and really get out there and kind of introduce, uh, themselves. And so that has been wild. Um, the Republican gubernatorial, uh, uh, primary was, bananas. Um, uh, we had, you know, 10 candidates uh, at one point, five of whom were kicked off the ballot for insignificant or fraudulent signatures, um, which made for including the two sort of front runners, the people that the two people that were thought to uh, have the most likely chance of both winning the primary and potentially um, unseating the governor. Uh, and so that process, I think, um, has made the Republican challenger uh, to the governor, Tudor Dixon, in a, in, a, um, in a tougher spot. She hasn't had as much time to bring the party together and she hasn't uh, been able to raise nearly as much money as the, the governor has. And so um, all of our most recent polls show a, a, a relatively healthy lead um, for uh, the, Governor Whitmer, but obviously we shouldn't um, count our chickens before they're hatched and we'll see um, how that shakes out. In the, the House and Senate, what's I think really interesting, um, similar to what Jose described, um, is this possibility of seeing a flip um, in one or, or both chambers. Uh, and so the Republicans have controlled both the House and Senate um, for the last 11 years and for the last um, like 38 years, <laughs> Republicans have uh, controlled the Senate. And so to think about the possibility of, um, because of these new district boundaries that are drawn in a way that makes more of the seats um, competitive and, and uh, you know, less gerrymandered, there's actually a possibility um, that Democrats uh, could, uh, could uh, flip, flip, likely one chamber. I mean, it's possible too, but you know, that is, that's, I think, hard for those of us that work in Lansing to like wrap our minds around because um, it would be such um, a sheet sea change in uh, legislative uh, leadership. Um, I think it's, it's still likely that, that we will have divided government, um, meaning one of the chambers will be controlled by the party that is um, not the governor's party. Um, but you know, I think that the margins between um, could get even smaller than they are now. And the smaller, the, the margins between the, the, the Dems and the Republicans in both chambers is relatively um, slim. Uh, in terms of turnover, I just would note that um, we have, uh, you know, two lawmakers that have been really crucial to uh, higher education funding in Michigan. Uh, well, actually more than two, but, but two in particular. Um, will no longer um, be there. Representative uh, Frederick, who's the majority floor leader in the House, he is the chair of the Higher Ed Appropriations um, uh, University and Community College Appropriations Subcommittee, and um, is the major champion of Michigan Reconnect, is, is term limited, and he has chosen not to run in the Senate. Um, and so that will be a huge loss for Michigan's uh, community colleges. Um, and then um, on the Senate side, uh, the, the, our chair for the last four years of higher ed appropriations, uh, Senator Kim Lasada, um, lost her primary, uh, which is very rare in Michigan for a sitting senator to lose uh, a, a primary. And so um, she has been a big champion for investing in higher education. So that will be a loss. And so I think one of the things that will be really exciting um, to see is who kind of takes over that mantle um, and really takes on higher ed approaches um, on, on, on both sides of the aisle. So loss of some of that institutional um, uh, institutional knowledge and skills and working the process, especially the budget process, I think is really gonna be, uh, is really gonna be felt. But I do think uh, Michigan is the state to watch on um, election night. 
uh, we are just about as purple of a state as you can get. And so I think that makes um, our races all the more uh, all the more exciting. I'm definitely a political junkie, um, if you couldn't tell. And uh, so I am very much eagerly awaiting uh, election night and staying up really late, but I would pop that popcorn because it will be fun to watch. So we're all gonna be expecting the unexpected, so. Who knows, some good surprises might just happen. So Stacy, we've heard, um, you know, both Brandy and Jose have mentioned the words champions and really at the community college level, presidents, you know, are the champion and you're out there champion, talking, communicating, spending a significant amount of time working with federal and state policymakers. Can you talk about, you know, what you have learned in the last, I don't know, two to three years um, about that part of your job and give us a little picture of some nuggets from that experience? Uh, well, it's a bigger part of my job than I thought it was going to be. And I never thought I would um, have um, the, leg the legislators on my uh, cell phone and I could text them day or night. And um, we frequently do that. We uh, meet and have side conversations in parking lots and, and also um, texting and, and just chatting about the issues that are impacting us. And, you know, during COVID, they would frequently call and ask, what are you guys doing? What's happening? Um, what are you seeing kind of at your level? What's so it's been really interesting. And um, I would say it's really hard to prepare. You know, if you're someone out there that's thinking about um, wanting to be a president, it's really hard to prepare for this part of your job um, because you're, you're not in it every day. But um, it's been really interesting. I would say um, if I had to give um, other pieces of advice, it would be, um, of course, at a community college, you know, oftentimes um, it's the first time our students are voting because some of them are just turning 18. So in talking with them about it and um, even what it's like to go to the polling booth, I think that's really important because it's kind of scary that first time. Um, to, and, and oftentimes, you know, I was a first generation voter. My parents didn't really vote. They vote now, I think, because we peer pressured them. But um, talking about that and why it's so important and, and then also bringing in some of those local um, issues and talking about, you know, why this or this is not important, you know, We've never seen before the school board elections being so important um, to our local community. So I think that's really important. I would also urge um, faculty uh, to lift your voices and student stories up to the presidents. Um, the legislators love to hear the stories about how their work is um, helping those students on a case by case basis. They want to hear those um, heartfelt stories about how the money has helped. Um, almost every time I lift a story up to the legislators, they just are so excited to hear it. And I think it's okay to also share with them some things that may or may not be working. So for example, Michigan Reconnect is an amazing program. It's terrific. But one of the little gaps that we've seen is to uh, book fees. Um, our students um, have struggled with that. And, and so um, I have to share that story with our foundation and also um, those legislators to say, this has been a little gap for us. This is how we're tackling it. But just so you know, this has been a little gap because it's so amazing. It, it's so great, but, but that's been a little gap. Um, but, but again, I think if, if I could tell the faculty on the call or um, you know, student service folks, anything is to lift the stories up to your president so that they can convey them um, to those legislators. They want to hear it. And I think, you know, I think sometimes when they're moving dollars around um, and, and they, they want to hear those stories because it makes their jobs more meaningful as well. So um, just think about that um, next time you have a great story to share. I think they'll want to hear it. That's great advice. Um, you know, as I hear from legislators all the time and they want to know what does this mean to someone and what does this mean to someone in my district? Um, that's so important because it does move them. So for all of you out there, you know, when you have those encounters, those stories, um, you know, as Stacy mentioned, share it along because then Brandy and I can also parrot it over here in Lansing and we can make sure to get that word out. And so that's so important. Jose, as you think about um, 
you know, this renewed interest in talent development. Um, you know, I think over the years, there's been, you know, a lot of public narrative questioning, you know, really the value of that college credential. Um, but now we're seeing an even greater and greater connection between talent and economic vitality. Is that here to stay, that connection? I think so. I think so, definitely. But with the caveat that it's all about how we frame it from our institutions and also how much we adapt, right? If you think about why the value of community of higher education has been questioned recently, it's all tied up to student loan and the student loan debt burden that you've seen and the idea that you have to take so much money just to enroll. So for us as community colleges, we have the lowest tuition rates in the country without by a mile, if not longer. And so putting that to the forefront and showcasing that we have a strong value to our degrees, to our programs, because one, you're not paying that much, but two, the quality of education you're getting is the kind that is going to get you into a well-paying job. Um, I, I mentioned earlier the conference that I was in last week and how like some industries are trying to move away from the bachelor's degree. That doesn't mean they're moving away from a post-secondary degree or some sort of credential. And so this is the part where I, I say like, yes, it's here to stay, but we also need to be very diligent about moving with the times and adapting and ensuring that we're showcasing the work we've already been doing for a long time on the non-credit side, on the credential side, on the short-term program side, on the reskilling side, because we're not just handing out AAs, we're not just providing credit for transfer, we're also giving folks the tools they need to go immediately and short in a short time, short time, go into a new job, go into a better paying job. So I think that's the key, staying on top of things, um, modernizing the way we do things, working hand in hand with industries to ensure that they're still needing the credentials that we're handing and that the trainings that we're providing are meeting the prerequisites that they need for their hiring. That's going to guarantee that post-secondary credentials are going to be, are going to be here for stay because employers need a way to measure and value the employability of folks. Um, but also again, like ensuring if we if we couple together all the work that we're doing on on our programs and making sure our programs stay up to date with these investments that at the state level and ideally someday at the federal level we put together whether it's through short-term Pell or increased Pell grants generally or additional student support services we couple those two together then we're tackling the value issue from post-secondary education is too expensive but also uplifting the value aspect of you are getting a good paying job and you are getting making your time count. That's excellent. I think I was in probably at least three meetings today already where incoming legislators are already talking about skills, values, credentials, and it's great to see that and associating that with community college. So it's an exciting time. So I agree, hopefully it'll stay. We'll all keep our fingers crossed and hope that'll all happen. Brandy, as you know, you do your work, you know, and I know the MCCA board of directors adopted a new strategic plan this summer. And, you know, can you tell us, you know, a little bit more about that plan, what it means for the collective work, and how you see the Center for Student Success contributing to that plan? Yeah, definitely. So um, uh, it's important to remember how MCCA is governed. I report to a massively huge board. Um, when I interviewed for this position almost a year ago, um, uh, my final interview was in front of the whole board of directors. Um, but what that meant, it was it was like one on 56. <laughs> so it was quite an intimidating uh, interview. We represent both the presidents and the trustees of institutions. And so um, from every one of our colleges, we have one president and one 
uh, representative uh, trustee. When I started in this role, we had 28 community colleges in our, our membership. I'm really proud to say that we amended our bylaws to allow tribal colleges to join MCCA. So we are now 31 members strong, um, which means I have a board of directors of 62. And to get 62 people to agree on anything um, um, and to agree to row in the same direction is really, really challenging. Um, and I think that's especially true um, in Michigan because we are not part of a system. Our community colleges are are not only autonomous from the state, but it's important to remember that they're really autonomous from each other. Um, and so any collaboration they do is, is, is voluntary. And really we want MCCA to be the, the vehicle to really facilitate that collaboration. And so when I started um, in early this year, I asked uh, the board of directors to work with me on a refreshed strategic plan for the association. The previous one had been done prior to COVID, and even though that was only a couple of years ago, it feels like decades ago. Um, and so I think we were able to really take a look at the association with a fresh set of eyes, with a, you know, a new leader, these new members. Um, we've had a, you know, lots of, of new presidents um, come on board over these last couple of years and, and to take a fresh look at the association. And so that's what the new strategic plan um, will represent. We um, uh, adopted a new mission statement, and it is that the MCCA is the unified voice for Michigan's community colleges, empowering members to lead in the areas of student success, talent development, and community vital vitality. And it was really purposeful and intentional that we put the word student success in our mission statement. Um, uh, it is. It was not previously in our mission statement, and um, that was something that I'm really proud that the board, um, you know, led with. And uh, we are just unbe I am unbelievably proud of the work that the Center for Student Success does, and we want to make it really much more clear that the Center for Student Success is not this sort of added appendage to the MCCA, but really is integrated and core to the function of, of the association. And so one way we um, demonstrated that is through this new adopted mission statement. Um, uh, we also uh, adopted uh, five uh, priority areas um, and, um, and a set of vision statements. So I'll just talk through a, a couple of them. One thing that was really clear is that the association's, you know, frankly, most valuable role is through public policy and advocacy. Um, it is not uh, presidents like uh, President Young have are, you know, need to be at their campuses and focused on running their institutions and can't always be here in Lansing. And so that is what Monica and I are there for. Um, and so we will continue to be um, to make um, public policy and, and advocacy and really influencing um, uh, on policy areas that impact community colleges our top priority. Um, we also uh, will focus on uh, strengthening awareness and recognition of the role of community colleges. Community colleges do so many incredible um, things each and every day, and we want to be the ones that help amplify uh, their work um, through, through the state, um, and then just be a capacity builder for our institutions. And like I said, service that hub for collaboration um, between uh, members. I think that's a huge value add for the association. Um, uh, we adopted a specific goal around D, E, and I. Um, so we have a specific goal that I want to be held accountable uh, for um, to, to develop a comprehensive commitment to DEI and by including DEI principles and practices in all of our work, um, continue to provide benefits and member services to our, um, to our, our, our members to make them stronger um, and, uh, and then just make the, the overall like structure of the association itself uh, stronger. We had a little bit of staff turnover um, when I first uh, first started, and so this has been. We are currently in the process of hiring some new individuals um, to work at the association, and so I'm really really excited to kind of 
bust into next year with a bigger team um, of, of dedicated professionals working with me uh, each and every day, um, working with this new uh, crop of legislators uh, to really um, to really uh, make the voice of community colleges uh, known uh, through the state. We are working on just putting like the final publishing uh, uh, details out on our strategic plan and it should be up on our website within the next um, two weeks. And so um, I want to make sure you all check that out. Thanks, Brandy. That's a lot happening and a lot of good stuff happening for Michigan. So we're excited about that. Stacy, I'm going to give you my final question for the panelists, and then I know we have some questions coming in on the chat. So, you know, I just want to give you sort of the last word here, at least in terms of, you know, the questions that I'm asking. Um, you know, what is the last thing that I think you want to share? And I know, you know, Brandy mentioned student success. And I'm guessing it might be tied to student success because I know that's important to you. So what is something else that you want to share that you want to make sure that people know and realize? Well, I know we are um, getting to the point of our presentation where we want to hear questions from folks. So I'll, I'll make it speedy. I made some notes. So here it is. First of all, we absolutely in higher ed at community colleges in the state of Michigan have to embrace change. It's here, whether we like it or not, we need to go with it, not against it. Um, COVID loss of learning is gonna hit us like never before. I've been studying some of our local data. It's frankly pretty scary. Um, it's gonna be an issue, but um, we're gonna have to embrace it. And I long ago heard we teach the students we have, not the ones that we want. Of course, we would like students more prepared as they enter college, but that's just not gonna be the case. Um, it's probably gonna get worse before it gets better. So we're gonna to have to embrace those changes um, that are coming our way. Uh, you, the, as I mentioned earlier, jobs um, have changed. They will need something past high school and we are here and we can adapt to what those employers need. So there's no better time for community colleges. I think that's the best news for all of us. Um, we need to hear our employers and what they're saying and work right alongside of them so that we can help fulfill the jobs that they have. Our funding is getting closer and closer and more and more tied to completion. And we have to get better at um, making sure that um, we are paying attention to that and doing the things that help our students be more successful and really putting our money behind those things. Um, I will tell you, uh, the Student Michigan Community College Association Student Success Center is a place to call, especially for these issues that we're struggling with, with um, completion rates and um, our students coming in that might be a little lower than we might like them to be or less prepared for college. So let's let's um, embrace the Student Success Center and use them like never before. Let's make Erica and Jenny work for their money oh, um, really, really hard. Not that they weren't already, but let's, let's um, use them like never before and work together on some of these issues. And um, one thing I've read a lot about is um, Generation Z wanting to move us away from the two-party political system. So um, let's kind of hold on to our seats and watch that happen. I think um, this is an amazing generation of students and um, it'll be really cool to watch what they do. Um, I don't think they're gonna like us all bickering across the aisle to each other and um, because they have bigger issues they wanna tackle. So it'll be really cool to watch them. But my final word is no better time for community colleges. And I'm so thankful that we work here in Michigan and can help our students. Thanks so much, Stacy. Oh my gosh, that's great. And I know, I know I've seen a couple of, you know, messages, questions coming through the chat. And I know Erica may have received some directly as well. So Erica, I'm just going to have you kick off the questions that were coming into the, from the chat, just so that we don't miss anything that may have come to you directly. Great. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you for facilitating for us and for all the panelists. Um, so one of the first questions we got is, do you ever see Michigan having a state system like SUNY um, and what would be the pros and cons of that? Brandy, maybe I'll turn that over to you. Yeah, so I get that, asked that question a lot and um, I liken it to 
um, you know, once you squeeze that toothpaste out of the tube, it's really hard to put it back in. And that's sort of the situation we are in. Our institutions of higher education have enjoyed so much autonomy for as long as Michigan has been a state um, that it's really hard to imagine reeling uh, that back. What makes Michigan so unbelievably unique as the only state without any form of a system or a SHEO um, is that it's uh, it's really embedded in our constitution. So it, and, and then community colleges derive the autonomy constitutionally in, in statute, which is a really complicated way of saying um, it would be really hard to, to undo. Um, the reason we have so much autonomy, um, we can thank the University of Michigan. The University of Michigan was a university before the state was a state. And so as they embarked on their first constitutional convention to, to get statehood in Michigan, uh, uh, Michigan said, under no circumstances will this new state government have anything to do with us. We want a statewide elected board. And then as other institutions came um, online, uh, we derived that autonomy. So, so my short answer is, is no, I don't think we will ever, it's hard for me to fathom or imagine um, uh, uh, getting a system. Um, and, you know, a huge pro for that is really being hyper nimble and being community colleges being incredibly locally responsive. Um, to their community's needs without going through um, levels of bureaucracy. However, I will say, and Stacy mentioned this at the very end of her remarks, um, uh, you know, it it is true that I think this as as data becomes a lot more transparent, um, the state will have a lot more of an interest in the ongoings of community colleges, both in terms of student success, in terms of financial viability, and we you know can and, and should expect a bit of a heavier hand or, or, or more strings tied to the funding that we receive. And I think that is something we should, um, we should really expect and, and be mindful of. Great, thanks, Brandy. Um, Jose, I have a couple questions for you. Um, Josh asks if you have any insight into whether we can expect another round of congressionally directed spending requests or were earmarks a one-off last year? Um, and the second question is, um, how can people stay informed about what's going on in Washington through some of the resources at ACCT? Thank you, Erica. Um, on the first question, no pun intended, that is the million dollar question. Uh, what I can tell you is there is a very high likelihood that it is not a one year off. We are expecting to see at least a second round because we do have um, congressionally direct spending projects or community funding projects um, in the house in the FY22 bills in the I mean in the FY23 bills that are currently being considered the big question is whether those remain if we don't finish the appropriations process by the end of this year the bigger question is will we have them next congress I can't give you a definite answer. I can tell you that there is bipartisan support for earmarks, especially given all the new changes that came about, all the increased transparency and the limitation to only nonprofits or government entities. Um, there are a lot more Republicans this year for FY23 that submitted project requests than they did for FY22. So it seems to me like they are warming up to it. However, we will not know if that was enough to keep it if it, if both chambers flip or if one of the chambers flips and the new majority decides that they want to eliminate it or not. So a lot of Republicans will not tell you in public that they like this project, but obviously everybody likes to take money to their district um, and to their constituents. And so I do know that there is a strong support for it. I think it's it has a good chances of remaining in place for the next Congress, but it's not a guarantee. And just like the projects currently for FY23, to be honest, I'm unclear what happens with a project that was submitted by Representative Levin, for example, if the bill has not been signed into law before he leaves Congress. 
that's a big question mark that I have myself and that I'm trying to get an answer from appropriators, but they will not give me a definite answer. <laughs> Um, as for the second part, Erica, there's a lot of ways to get to stay engaged, and I think it's important to do so once that you know whenever there are federal funding opportunities, but two, so you can also stay on top of like what new bills or what new proposals lawmakers are proposing that that may impact your institutions. Easiest way for us is if you saw follow us on social media, especially on Twitter, or Facebook, or LinkedIn, we tend to put a lot of that content out there too. But I think more directly to your inboxes, we have what we call latest action in Washington, which is a weekly alert. We send it once a week typically, unless Congress has been very busy. Um, and it's usually Wednesdays, middays, where we just tell you what is in queue for that week or what has transpired over the past week that is of in increasing relevance. Um, a good example is that is where we have announced whenever the Department of Education or Labor have announced new grant competitions, whether it's the completion fund, the basic needs funds, or the strengthening community college training grants, we announce them there. We share links and resources to the announcement as well as any webinars or any uh, supporting materials that the department may have already posted to help you prepare your application. Uh, whenever we organize our own webinars or own trainings or or federal updates, we tend to share them there as well. So that's a really great way to do it. If you'd be interested in joining our law alerts, please send me an email at jmiranda.acct.org. And I'll also drop a link on the chat that takes you to um, where we host our most five recent law alerts. And right under that, you can also sign up yourself. Um, Thanks, Jose. I dropped a couple of those uh, links in the chat as well for folks who um, may be accessing the chat. Okay, uh, let's keep going with some questions. Brandy, I'm going to go back to you. Um, David asked if there are any additional bachelor's degree programs being explored and or considered for community colleges to offer. Yeah, super good question. So, and I want to be real uh, careful and clear about sort of what we were able to accomplish with the nursing um, uh, a program. Mm -hmm. the, the compromise that we reached and the funding that we received is really around kind of a, a new a paradigm shift on um, transfer articulation agreements between two and four years. Um, that will allow students to complete a bachelor's degree in nursing through a three plus one uh, program in partnership with a university where the university comes to the student at the community college as opposed to the student going to the university. So I think it's a really innovative way of um, thinking about earning bachelor's degrees on physically on community college uh, campuses, but still with, in partnership with, with universities. If this works well, I do see a world in which it would be a really compelling ask um, for the for us to come back to the legislature with other innovative pathways um, where students can, um, particularly students in rural communities that don't have easy access to a university, are able to, to stay right where they are, stay working in their community while earning a bachelor's degree using all of the assets of, of community colleges. Um, uh, Erica and I have been talking a lot about ways that community colleges can get more involved with training educators given the severity of teacher shortage. Um, I've also thought a lot about how we could replicate this pathway for those um, that are first responders. Um, I'm, I'm the daughter and the sister of firefighters. So I come from a long uh, tradition of firefighters um, where you really need um, a, a certification and an associate degree to get started. But if you want to take on leadership roles by becoming um, a captain, for example, or a chief, you need a bachelor's degree. And so I also think that those kind of public safety, that public safety pathway could be a really excellent way um, for community colleges um, to support a crucial need in their um, in their in their communities. Uh, and then lastly, I'll just say I, I do think that there are other um, allied health fields or, or uh, healthcare fields where this would be a really natural um, fit beyond um, nursing to go in some to other healthcare 
uh, healthcare specialties. But I think what what kind of finally uh, you know helped to clear the logjam that we had on this issue is is really just you know putting down the weapons <laughs> that we were all carrying on this on this issue that was very divisive amongst higher ed institutions and very divisive among legislators um, to say, you know, what are the best assets of community college and the best assets of universities and how can we leverage both to make um, a pathway for students that's that's seamless, accessible, affordable, accelerated. Um, and, and, and yeah, so that's, that's my answer. Sorry, that was a long winded answer. <laughs> Brandy, I'm going to ask you a follow up question. Um, I don't think you mentioned it. Uh, there was a lot to cover in the state legislative update. Um, but can you talk a little bit about um, the language that was included in the budget uh, about the universities accepting community college transfer credit? Yeah, and I, I can while I'm at it, I'll just I'll mention I in the interest of time, I sort of flew through the legislative um, update, but there were some boilerplate um, uh, boilerplate language changes that are impactful to community colleges. Um, boilerplate is just um, basically just means the strings attached to funding. Um, and so uh, there was a couple of pieces. One um, was one that the Center for Student Success was really the lead advocate for. Um, and I just kind of helped to uh, amplify their voices, but that is to really um, require that universities um, accept all forms of dual enrollment credit uh, and, and all universities uh, that receive operational funding from the state make sure that regardless of whether or not the student were, was taking a dual enrollment class that counted toward their high school graduation, whether the physical class was delivered online or at a high school or at a community college, whether the composition of the class was all high school students all college students are like a blend, um, you know, none of those can, should be factors when determining whether or not a university should accept dual enrollment um, credit. Uh, and so we were able to get that as a requirement that universities uh, must not consider those criteria. Um, the other thing, the other two things, I guess I would mention on the boilerplate um, uh, front is one that the legislature, and this is, small, but I think it's really powerful and symbolic. The legislature codified the governor's 60 by 30 goal in the higher education budget. Um, we know that 60 by 30 has been a huge priority of, of Governor Whitmer's. It's really important that, you know, whether it be in a couple of months or in, in four years in a couple of months, that when whenever we have the next governor, that the next, uh, the next governor and the future versions of our legislature still embrace this post-secondary educational attainment as a priority. Um, so the fact that they codified it into their, the legislative budget, I think was, um, was powerful um, as well. And then um, just another good example of, I think the state wanting to play a bigger role in community colleges and take away some of that autonomy the budget did include tuition restraint language. It was a pretty high tuition restraint cap of 5% of or $226, whichever is greater. But I, you know, that was definitely a signal um, uh, to, to us as colleges uh, that they are watching um, where colleges are setting their tuition and given, um, and sort of we expected this ever since Reconnect was passed, but given that they are making so many investments by, and making community college tuition free, there is, I think, a very natural concern that community colleges, well, if it's gonna be free, jack up your tuition really high and the state will cover it. Um, I, you know, that doesn't play out in reality, but you know, it's certainly an understandable um, desire. And, and so, so that's uh, a little tidbit of an example of where the legislature is getting a little bit more involved with some decisions that um, historically have been totally left to the institutions. Well, thank you so much. Um, Monica, thank you for facilitating our panel. Um, Brandy, Jose, Stacy, thank you for your comments and your thoughts. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, I know this is the work that you all do every day, um, but it really, I think, helps us and our audience 
kind of separate the the noise of what we see um, in the media from what we like to hear from you as our experts. So I really appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, for our audience, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen again. Um, again, thank you to our presenters. Uh, and um, I'd like to transition us, transition us into the next uh, kind of closing out of our session. Um, I want to remind you, we had a great session yesterday, uh, obviously today, and then we have two more days of the Student Success Summit. Um, tomorrow really focuses on the learner experience and how we're supporting our students. That'll be uh, primarily facilitated by my colleagues, Jenny Schenker and Precious Miller. Um, and then on Friday, uh, we'll be focusing on some work that we've been doing in Michigan. And I think Jose mentioned uh, the interest in aligning community college coursework with uh, industry credentials and that kind of really important role there. So we'll be talking a lot about that work and some of our transfer pathways. Uh, and we are really fortunate to hear from a nationally recognized journalist, Paul Fain. Um, you would recognize Paul from uh, his previous positions uh, as an editor and a reporter at Inside Higher Ed and the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, and so he'll be sharing a lot of the work that he's hearing about across the country as well. Uh, we would really appreciate it if you would complete our session evaluation. Um, you probably know what a QR code is by now, but if you if you point your camera um, at the uh, 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 screen there, you'll be able to complete super quick session evaluation and then Precious put that information in the chat for me as well. Um, so uh, the last thing we are doing here in about the last 10 minutes of my session is that um, we want to just do about 10 minutes here to do some speed networking. Um, so uh, when, like I said earlier, when we were planning this conference a year ago, uh, you may remember that it looked quite uncertain that we would have to have something in person. Um, and so we wanted to build in this opportunity to do some speed networking, uh, to be able to just kind of be randomly connected with some of your colleagues from across the state. Um, I know that some of you will probably have to leave now, um, and so if you're if you're if you have another commitment that you need to get to, um, feel free to exit the meeting now. But for those of you who are still here, um, we are going to go into breakout sessions, and really, it's just an informal opportunity to connect with your peers from across the state. Um, you never know. I, I think of this as waiting in line for coffee at a conference um, and all the amazing people that you meet when you do that, uh, that you never would have met otherwise. Um, so I'm going to create breakout rooms uh, and feel free to use some of the questions that we included in our uh, uh, journal that we created for the summit as well that we shared earlier on. Um, and if I don't, uh, you'll just be able to leave right from the breakout rooms. And if I don't see you, um, I will look forward to seeing you tomorrow at three o'clock. Thank you so much. <laughs>